Well, as we turn to God's Word, I want to read this morning from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 16 through 19, and then 25 through 30. Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 16. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners, and yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. And then picking up at verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all of you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, in my former professional life as an attorney, I handled a few workers' compensation cases. I read about a case from another state once, filed by a man injured while repairing a chimney. This, this is his report that he filed. When I got to the building, I found that the hurricane had knocked some bricks off the top. So I rigged up a beam with a pulley at the top of the building and hoisted up a couple of barrels full of bricks. When I fixed the chimney, there were a lot of bricks left over. So I hoisted the barrel back up again and secured the line at the bottom and then went up and filled the barrel with the extra bricks. Then I went to the bottom and cast off the line. Unfortunately, the barrel of bricks was heavier than I was. And before I knew what was happening, the barrel started down, jerking me up and off the ground. I decided to hang on to the rope and halfway up, I met the barrel coming down and received a severe blow on the shoulder. I then continued to the top, banging my head against the beam and getting my finger jammed in the pulley. When the barrel hit the ground, it burst its bottom, allowing the bricks to spill out. And you can see where this is headed. I was heavier than the empty barrel, and so I started down again at a high speed. Halfway down, I met the barrel coming up, and received a severe injury to my shins. When I hit the ground, I landed on the bricks, getting several painful cuts from the sharp edges. At this point, I must have lost my presence of mind because I let go of the line. The barrel then came down, giving me another heavy blow on the head and putting me in the hospital. There ends the report, thankfully for this fellow. Now what this story tells us, rather painfully and poignantly, is that life is filled with ups and downs. In this man's case, literally. We don't move through life as though we're going along on a flat plane. There are plenty of peaks and valleys along the way. We certainly seem to be experiencing quite a number of these ups and downs, and especially downs so far this year, aren't we? The coronavirus pandemic has dropped barrels of fear into our heads. Where might this invisible virus be hiding? Will our hospitals have the capacity to handle all of the COVID-19 cases? We're wearing masks. We're staying six feet apart from one another. We're washing our hands so much more than we ever did before, and even our groceries. We're confined to our homes. Schools have closed, businesses have closed, churches have closed, and we've witnessed every sporting event just about 
come to an end until recently. And here we are, still under siege by and large, as evidenced by the fact that you're watching this worship service from your computer or your cell phone, rather than being here in this worship space. And it looks like this will be our world for a while longer. Then add the George Floyd killing and the resulting protests, often peaceful but sometimes violent, and the challenge facing us of the issue of racism and, and, and the challenge of facing that issue in ways that we haven't before as a nation. And you have the markings and makings of a very stressful year. And by the way, I failed to mention that we have an election coming up in a few months. Yikes. And then there are those burdens that we may be carrying that have nothing to do with the world around us. They're the ones resting on our hearts and our minds, such as guilt or regret or fear of failure or illness or perfectionism or anger or resentment or loneliness. Maybe nobody else knows about it or can see it, but we're walking around under the weight of some really heavy worries. And if we're people of faith, we might be struggling in our relationship with God because of some of those concerns. Can God really love me given the real me inside? Awareness of our sin can sometimes make us feel unworthy of God's love and thus afraid or bereft. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Jesus makes this promise to his disciples and to his followers such as you and me, to all of us who feel the oppressive weight of worry or guilt or fear, he invites us to come to him for rest. The great old hymn sung by Methodists for generations, what a friend we have in Jesus seems to echo these comforting words of the, our Lord. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. The third stanza of the hymn says, Are we weak and heavy laden? Cumbered with a load of care, precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. I've got a more modern song in mind, one by the Hollies, I think. He ain't heavy, he's my brother. Jesus looks at us as his brothers or sisters and says that whatever we're carrying around with us does not weigh us down so much as to make it impossible for him to lift us up and out of our sin or guilt or fear or despair. No matter what our concerns, no matter what weighs on our minds, it's not too heavy for Jesus. Our brother, our friend, our savior. Like a loving brother or friend, Jesus offers to help us carry our burdens. He's there to share in our pain and give us peace of heart and mind, no matter what adversity we might be facing. Jesus makes this offer not because we deserve it, but because he loves us. What a friend we have in Jesus, indeed. Just like a best friend, he really cares about us whenever we're hurting. He's there for us no matter what, loving us even when we fail to show him gratitude for his love. As a best friend, he remains loyal to us even when we turn our backs on him. As a best friend, he can always be counted on through thick or thin. As a best friend, he never asks, what's in it for me? He just reaches out. Reaches out with arms open wide, as wide as the cross. Embracing us in life-giving love. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you. Jesus says something else in today's scripture from Matthew. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. 
for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Take my yoke upon you. In the Bible, the term yoke has a number of metaphorical meanings, but they're frequently not very positive. For example, in 1 Kings, from the Old Testament, Jeroboam and the assembly of Israel complained to Rehoboam, King Solomon's son, that his late father had put a heavy yoke upon them in the form of high taxes and conscripted labor. A yoke often represents slavery or servitude. It's also commonly referred to, to used to refer to the law. Unfortunately, the yoke of the law had often become not the blessing God had intended it to be for the people of Israel, but a heavy burden when the Pharisees and the scribes applied it harshly and without love and compassion. Jesus, though, offers a different kind of yoke. He says, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Now, what does Jesus mean by this? Several images come to my mind. First of all, when just before that Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, it means that we must submit ourselves to Jesus. Placing Christ's yoke upon our shoulders means that we are subservient to the Lord. In other words, the rest Jesus promised us may be relief, but it's not a release from service to God. There's work to be done in God's kingdom, and Jesus invites us to join in and to pull our weight. As Thomas Long phrases it, what Jesus offers is not a habit, but a yoke. The second thought that comes to my mind is that when Jesus says to take his yoke, the implication is that we are under a yoke already. As with the Pharisees and scribes, many of us are under the yoke of legalism when it comes to how we try to obey God. We're not joyful in our obedience. Rather, we wear a straitjacket of fear, afraid of what our transgressions might be to a God who we think must be ready to smite us with his judgment. Or maybe we have on the yoke of the other extreme a casualness about the consequences of our actions so that we and those around us are being pulled down by the fallout from our less than wise selfish choices. <clears throat> or maybe... We're wearing the yoke of despair, resulting from the unwillingness to let go of our past transgressions and our failure to accept, really accept, Jesus' offer of complete forgiveness. Instead, we walk around with the weight of every mistake we've ever made, pressing down on our shoulders. So taking the yoke of Jesus is not adding to our burdens because we're already under a yoke of one kind or another. Instead, it's substituting his yoke, which is easy, for the other yokes we carry around that drag us down. A properly designed yoke is one that doesn't excessively chafe the shoulders of the work animal. Jesus' yoke is easy, which in the Greek of the New Testament means kind, so that his yoke won't rub our shoulders the wrong way and is kinder to us. Because Jesus' burden is light, if we choose it, instead of what we've been lugging around, our troubles, our worries will also be lightened. They don't suddenly go away, but the weight on our shoulders is lessened, and we're better able to handle it. Billy Strayhorn tells a story about a young boy who was helping his father with yard work one day, and his dad asked him to pick up uh, some rocks that were in a particular area of the yard, but soon he noticed that his son, his son was struggling with one very large rock that was buried there. And after a while, his dad walked over to the little boy, and he noticed that the boy was defeated, and, and he, he gave up, and he said to his dad, I can't do it. His father said, did you use all of your strength? The boy seemed pained by this question. He said, yes, sir, I used every ounce of strength I had. His dad smiled and replied, no, you didn't. You didn't ask me to help. Then he went over to his son closer, and together they lifted the large rock buried in the soil. The 
third and final image that comes to my mind when contemplating the yoke that Jesus offers is that a yoke by design is generally built for two. It looks like a big M, and you put it over the shoulders of the two oxen or other work animals, and this is significant because it means, it means that Jesus is not saying that we're to bear the responsibility of service to God alone or that we have to carry our burdens alone. No, when he says to take my yoke, he's letting us know that he will help shoulder the burden, every burden that we may have. That he will be right there by our side, pulling along with us as we struggle against the weight placed on our shoulders. We're not to go it alone. We don't go it alone if we accept Jesus' yoke. Because he's right there with us. Always. Praise the Lord. Now most of us probably don't have any actual experience with the yoke of an oxen. But there's a great guy in the church, in the church I served in Brevard named Mike Bradley, whose late father did it. He and I talked about it one day, and Mike referred to the G and haw used when pulling a team of oxen. G and haw are the commands to turn right and left, respectively, used by the farmer walking next to the oxen when he wants them to turn at the end of a row, being plowed. Mike said something to me that, in passive, which gave me an important theological insight regarding the yoked oxen. He said that if they both don't go forward, the team will go in circles. What that tells me in the context of Jesus' statement about taking his yoke upon us is that if we don't also move alongside Jesus forward with him, if we just drag our feet spiritually and fail to give it any effort, then our progress will be thwarted. We won't go forward in our spiritual journey nearly as far as we might have had we actively moved along with Jesus, alongside of him, and learned from him, as he encourages us to do in today's scripture. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, he says. While Jesus may be the one who carries on his shoulders the heaviest burden, we still need to put forth effort ourselves if we hope to make real lasting progress. And we need to pay attention to Jesus and to what he teaches. We need to listen for the G and the hall. Otherwise, we're just work walking in circles. Well, that <laughs> there sure is a whole lot found in that term yoke, isn't there? Jesus has given us a, a, an amazing amount of ideas and lessons and meaning in that one phrase. But as we wrap this up, I, here's something important to note. Even though a yoke is a device that restricts the movement of the animals or persons wearing it, it also functions to guide them and in doing so actually liberates them. So in this weekend when we celebrate the freedoms we enjoy in our nation, Jesus gives us another lesson. He reminds us to celebrate as Christians the freedom that he gives us from the bondage that might be on our shoulders. He gives us the freedom from the bondage to sin that without his grace we're stuck in like mud. His yoke gives us freedom to live, to live life fully as he desires us to do so. His yoke gives us the freedom to hope when the chaos of the world says otherwise. His yoke gives us the freedom to love as we are first loved by Him. To love all persons. His yoke gives us all true freedom. I want you to hear one more time Jesus' words of comfort from the end of chapter 11 of Matthew. This time from the message, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase. The Bible. Hear now these comforting words. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the un 
recourse to rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me.